Um, good, a very, very warm welcome, first of all, from myself, Monica Boomduchen. As some of you may already be aware, I'm the initiator and the director of the Insiders Outsiders Project, which was intended and still is intended in the first instance to play, pay tribute in a, in a detailed and perhaps more analytical and critical way to the immense contribution made by refugees from Nazi Europe to this country's culture, particularly focusing on the visual arts, but not exclusively by any means. Um, the festival itself took place in the good old days, face to face between March 2019 and uh, March 2020, COVID struck and Thankfully, you know, I really am eternally grateful the festival was coming to an end, the physical festival coming to an end anyway. And the obvious sort of next step was to go online. And so we have, as many of you will be aware, we've been uh, organizing an ongoing, it still is very much happening now and in the future, program of online events on all manner of different subjects related in some way to that topic. Uh, again, as some of you may know, uh, actual trip to the Isle of Man was planned for, well, actually now, mid-October, and actually fears about COVID, not COVID itself necessarily, but the kind of uncertainties of COVID meant that we decided to play safe and to postpone it until next uh, March. And I will say more about that at the very end. And we decided, on the assumption that it was going ahead, that we would accompany the trip or kind of contextualize it more broadly with a program of events, online events relating to different aspects of the internment experience. Um, and of course, this is one of them. In fact, this is actually the last evening of the series. And before I forget to mention it, at eight o'clock is another event, which some of you may like to um, sign on to, on music in internment, uh, specifically focusing on Hans Gall, the Austrian-born emigre composer, who actually wrote the music for a very brilliant satirical cabaret in the internment camp itself and, and that should be really fascinating too so do, do join us if you can. Um, the other events that have happened so far are already um, or will be actually not all of them yet but will be on our Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel which uh, again I can mention again at the very the very end but let me now without further ado introduce our two speakers for today. The prompt for today's event is the publication in 2020, and of course then once again external events intervened, of um, a book, a wonderful book, which some of you maybe have already read, perhaps not, in which case you'll be glad to know there is in fact a 20% discount being offered on the book, uh, which again I will mention at the very end and I'll type in the details into the chat, um, called, um, in fact it's the title more or less of the event itself, Interment in Britain 1940, Life and Art behind the wire and it tells a wonderful story of a friendship and there's an, uh, a chapter contextualizing the friendship uh, by Charmian Brinson, who I don't think is with us tonight, but she will in fact be giving a talk um, as part of a sequel, a series that's going to be happening later this year, which I will again come back to. Uh, but we've got most importantly for today's purposes, we've got Ines Newman, the granddaughter of the uh, engineer who's the kind of star of the story in a sense, um, Hollicher, and Rachel Dixon, art historian, curator of the Ben Hurry, who will be talking about the friendship between um, Hollicher and um, Hugo Dachinger, and indeed then set the story of the paintings, the portraits that he painted of Hollicher in a broader context of creativity again, you know, sort of in the most adverse of circumstances. So Ines first, let me just admit a few more people while I can. Um, Ines has worked extensively in local government, not in the arts, um, but she spent the last four years researching her family history. And I suspect Ines, it's not quite yet the end of the story once you get, <laughs> once you get started. She's the author of um, several articles and book chapters on local economic development and local government policy, and has edited um, one other book called Promoting Social Cohesion, Implications for Policy and Evaluation uh, in, in 2011, that was, and written uh, a solo authored book um, called Reclaiming Local Democracy, A Progressive Future for Local Government in 2014. But of course, most importantly, she is the kind of really the driving force behind and one of the main contributors to the book that I've already mentioned. So over to you, Ines, with great pleasure. Thank you very much, Monica. And then uh, thank you uh, uh, for inviting us to, to this event. I'm mean, very, very pleased to, to, to be here and to do it. Now I'm going to try and share screen. Um, yeah, wait a minute, so we have to go back, back, back. Um, you need to go back, because that, that's not the first slide, is it? Um, 
first slide. Now, why isn't it going back? Wait a minute, I shall sort it. This is me learning about new technology a bit. Oh. Wait a minute. That's it. Go to that. Sorry, I'm started at the beginning. Right, that's in. <laughs> Let me start by introducing you to my maternal grandfather. That's uh, Wilhelm Hobbitcher. Um, I think you can see he's a very warm character and he was a bon viveur who liked to laugh with his friends. And I would have loved to have met him. Um, I'm sure he would have been loving and fun. And I know he was a very good storyteller. He grew up in poverty in uh, Mikkelsburg, which is now Mikulov. It's in southern Moravia in the Czech Republic. Um, so if I go to that, that is a picture of his, him with his uh, five siblings. He's on the right of the screen. He, and in fact, um, apart from the grandchildren of Mark, who's the one next to his mother, there in the centre, um, the, uh, which are stepchild grandchildren who, who were not Jewish. We, me and my siblings, are the only descendants of that family. The rest either died or were perished in the Holocaust. So it's always quite moving to me to see that picture uh, and realise uh, how many people were lost. But um, uh, fortunately, my grandfather, Wilhelm, survived. And uh, he trained as an engineer uh, and became the chief engineer of the first Danubian shipping company in 19, 1829. Uh, it was founded by the Austrian government to transport passengers and cargo on the river. By 1880, it was the biggest river shipping company in the world. And uh, this picture, the next one, is of a crane that uh, apparently he designed. It has a rather weird shape on the left, which is a sort of King Kong image emerging. I'm not quite sure the origin of this picture, but uh, it is his, uh, his crane, apparently. And uh, he had quite a, a good career as an engineer and quite a comfortable middle-class life until the Holocaust, and, uh, well, until the fascists came to power. And then he has a very vivid de description in his diary of the Anschluss, oh, not the Anschluss, and of uh, Kristallnacht. And, um, and then he lost his pension. He was taken away from him and he started to plot to come to England uh, in arriving here in 31st of March, 1939, at the age of 66. Um, he was assisted by the Bunzel family, who were owners of an international paper business who had already fled and who facilitated the uh, entry of around 40 uh, emigres to Britain. For those of you who've read the book, uh, there is a chapter I've written on Wilhelm's life and history. But today I want to concentrate on why I put the book together and why I wanted to get it published. Wilhelm died in 1943, which was four years before I was born. And my family were in Egypt and only arrived in England in uh, 1949. And then in 1954, my mother died. And so we had no one to ask the questions you usually ask about your grandparents as you're getting older. And there's no doubt that the feeling of not knowing my mother and uh, her parents was a strong motivation in getting involved in family history. There was also the fact that uh, my older sister, Hannah, who was the one who had the language skills, I don't speak any German, unfortunately, uh, she was also getting older. And we thought if we didn't do the research now, it would be lost to future generations who wouldn't have the language skills to look into it. And then my brother Ralph uh, discovered that the Wiener Library held my grandfather's diary. It was started three months after he arrived in England in March 39. There was actually a diary in Vienna that he'd written from 1914, but we've unfortunately never been able to find that. But the one in England, he filled in daily until his death in 1943. 
and it was a big surprise. It was in 14 exercise books, written in neat, but to us, fairly illegible handwriting. And the library helped us find uh, someone to transcribe it first. And then my sister Hannah started the long job of translation. The, the diary contained reflections on his personal life, the people he met, the political situation, commentaries of what he'd read, and interestingly, he listened to both British and Austrian radio, and anecdotes about his life. But what interested me most was the daily record of his internment as an enemy alien from 27th of June to the 31st of August, 1940. So my first purpose in putting the book together was to make people more aware of the horrors of internment policy. I myself knew very little about internment beyond the fact that there was an internment camp on the Isle of Man. Wilhelm was actually interned in Liverpool and Charmian Brinson has written an excellent book uh, about internment and uh, I, I believe is doing a further talk uh, as part of this Insiders Outsiders series. Um, the diary describes uh, both the horrors and the creativity generated by the camp, which included Nazis as well as many Jews, uh, who had recently escaped similar horrific conditions in Austria. Wilhelm was 67 and not in good health. He wanted desperately to return to his English home in South London, where he was surrounded by relatives. And he also made many friends in the camp, and that helped. And he participated in its rich cultural life. I will at the end uh, be reading some extracts from his diary and you'll get a feel for some of uh, his life within the camp. And his final conclusion that I will also read is that he benefited from his time in the internment camp. But this should not detract from the trauma of being locked up, particularly at the start when it was overcrowded, had dismal health care and situation and internees were sleeping in canvas tents that became waterlogged, filthy, there was no washing facilities and there were frequent suicides. Next picture I show is of those tents where many of them had to stay. The worst for, was for the 11,000 male internees who were shipped off to Canada and Australia including those in the Andorra Star. This is a picture of the Andorra Star, which was torpedoed on the 2nd of July, 1940, with a loss of 650 lives. Later, I will read Wilhelm's account of those shipped off on the Damera, which is the next ship, in which Charmian Brinson in our book explains in her chapter that they were treated incredibly badly. I thought it was important for people to understand how hard it was to be interned just after you'd escaped a traumatic environment. And this, I think, has lessons for today as refugees arrive on the beaches on the south coast and are locked up. The UK is the only country in Europe that doesn't have a time limit on detention. And the government claims it is a merely bureaucratic step to lock them up that precedes deportation. But this is a lie. The National Audit Office has shown that in 2019, 62% of detainees were released back into the community and remained in the UK. So why do it? These refugees are no more a threat to our country than my grandfather was. And there are other ways of keeping track of those who are finally going to be deported. It worries me that the lessons of the Second World War internment have still not been learned. Not only is there growing harsh treatment of refugees, and asylum seekers, which has been made worse by COVID. But also between 71 and 75, nearly 2,000 people, mostly Catholics, were interned in Northern Ireland. And in 1991, a total of 176 Iraqis and other Arabs were interned during the Gulf War. It's important, therefore, I think, to keep telling the story of internment, just as it is important to keep telling the story of the Holocaust. Things need to change. The second reason for publishing the book is to get greater recognition of the artist Hugo Dashinger, and uh, Rachel will be talking about him later. Hugo Dashinger was a young artist, also from Vienna, who Wilhelm befriended, and we found in Wilhelm's diary a detailed account of sitting for a portrait painted by Dashinger. Dashinger is not famous primarily, I think, because in England there was no real understanding of German Expressionist art and his art didn't sell easily. And I hope this book will belatedly give him the appreciation he deserves. 
When my grandfather first met him, he comments on the picture of nude women that decorated the room, joking it was a family picture. So here is one example of what my grandfather called a family picture. It is one of eight colour plates in the book, and Rachel Dickinson will be talking more about that shortly. The final reason I wanted to publish this book is that I found out it to be my grandfather's dream to publish his diary, pub together with Dashinger's paintings of internment. Bill Helm met up with Dashinger after they were both released from internment, and a friend of Dashinger's, Rossner, suggested the book project. My, father was my grandfather was very excited about the idea, but the blitz, the war shortages, and then his early death put an end to his dream. It has been very exciting to me to realise that dream, and it has been a delight for me to get to know my grandfather through his diary. He has emerged as an intelligent, kind, warm, funny, and charismatic man, if somewhat of a womaniser, and with very traditional views on gender. So that's all I need, wanted to say to start it off, and I'll hand over to Rich, Rachel now, who will carry on. Or Monica to introduce her, I don't know. Lovely. Thank you very much, Ines. That was a lovely way to start. Could you just stop screen sharing so that uh, Rachel can do the same? Thank you. Lovely. Good. So to Rachel now, many of you will, I think, have come across her already. She um, was for quite some time the head of curatorial services at, um, sorry, I should put my, I guess put my own video back on. Hold on. Um, um, why can I not move forward to the next image? There we go. There we go. It's okay. Fine, lovely. Um, good. Where was I? Yes, previously head of curatorial services at the Benuri Gallery in St. John's Wood. Um, and she's now the consultant editor at the newly formed Benuri Research Unit, known as Buru, which has rather broadened its focus of late to uh, move beyond Jewish um, artists to those of other immigrant backgrounds. Uh, since 1900, in fact, to the, to the very present. She's also a research uh, a member of the Research uh, Committee for German and Austrian Exile Studies, which is part of the University of London, very active on that, and a regular lecturer on all aspects of art and internment. And I should add, apropos that, that she wrote a wonderful chapter on that subject in the companion volume to the original Insiders Outsiders Festival, um, which um, is still available. And I think what I'm going to do, actually, we've got a, quite a lot of things that I can tell you about. I will send a follow-up email giving both the discount details on, on the current book and uh, details of the Insiders Outsiders volume as well and other things besides. So don't worry about uh, making a note of anything um, as, I, as I go. Um, lovely, I think that's probably good enough, uh, Rachel. Let me hand over to you now. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you, Monica, for um, that lovely introduction. And thank you, Ines, for that fascinating and warm introduction to your grandfather and for the always timely reminder of the continuing plight of refugees. Um, I'm going to return to the portrait or um, the Benuri portrait. So this is a work that's um, acquired into the Benuri collection in June 2016. So Benuri was delighted to acquire it from auction, uh, this distinctive head and shoulders portrait of a then unknown gentleman. Inscribed Dachinger Heighten, um, 1940, at Benuri, we immediately recognized it as an internment portrait by the Austrian emigre artist Hugo Pach Dachinger. Dating from this difficult moment in British wartime history, it was eagerly accessioned into Benuri's permanent collection of around 1400 works. Benuri itself was founded in 1915 in London's East End during the First World War by Orthodox Yiddish speaking Jewish emigre artists and craftsmen who had fled the Russian Pale of Settlement and were unable to access the cultural bastions of the British art establishment. While its focus remained on Jewish artists for its first hundred years, since 2016, as Monica has mentioned, it has a broader remit as the recently formed Benuri Research Unit with its database of emigre artists engages with the wider refugee and migrant experience and the contribution to British visual culture post 1900. So the portrait joined two later pen and ink drawings in the collection by Dachinger, which you can see on the screen. Paul Hammond's drawing class from 1962 on the left and Bell Street Market 1977, each depicting different aspects of the artist's life in exile in London. 
The earlier work references Dachinger's close ties with fellow internees, many of whom stayed in contact after release, their shared experience providing a ready-made network of cultured German speakers, often living in close proximity to one another in North London. Hamann, himself a noted sculptor and pupil of Rodin, was interned at Hutchinson on the Isle of Man, the so-called artist camp, given the number of high profile artist internees, including Dada S. Kirchfitters, expressionist Ludwig Meidner and Eric Kahn, Ben Uri's own first salaried curator, Fritz Solomonsky, and Fred Ullmann. Post release, many emigres attended Hammond's art classes held with his wife Hilda in St. John's Wood. Hammond was also a founder of the Hampstead based refugee cultural organization, the Free German League of Culture. Alongside these works, the general details of Dachinger's biography were also known to us. Born in Gmunden in Austria, he'd studied advertising in Leipzig, patented a system of movable type, and returned to Vienna to work for an international publisher. But following the Anschluss in March 1938, as a Jew, his career was effectively over. Escaping to London assisted by business contacts, he established Transposter Advertising Limited before suffering a second professional blow with the outbreak of war. And as, a, as an alien, he could no longer work in London. Nevertheless, he could at least channel his creativity as a fine artist, free from commercial and political constraints. As a direct result of Nazi persecution, Dachinger was among several hundred modernist slash Jewish slash left-wing artists and designers who took refuge here and it's through some of these figures, including Dachinger, and a number who featured in the Nazis' Degenerate Art Exhibition in Tate Kunst of 1937, such as the aforementioned Meidner, that Expressionism was introduced into Britain, albeit initially somewhat unsuccessfully. Even artists such as Meidner, who had an established reputation in Germany, found it difficult to find a new audience and to secure patronage face not only with the daily challenges of life in an unfamiliar country, with an unfamiliar language, but with the additional problem that, quote, to the general public in Great Britain, modern German art is totally unknown, end quote, as critic and art historian Herbert Reed wrote in his introduction to the exhibition 20th Century German Art held at the New Burlington Galleries in summer 1938 as a riposte to the Nazi degenerate art show. As far as the British public was concerned, many preferred their modern art to be French without the darker mood, weighty introspection, an often gloomy palette of expressionism. In June 1940, following the invasion of France, newly elected Prime Minister Winston Churchill issued a sweeping directive to quote, collar the lot, calling for all so-called enemy aliens to be interned, regardless of whether or not they had been victims of Nazi oppression in their homelands. Dachinger was duly swept up in the mass internment of around 27,000 enemy aliens, mostly Jewish refugees, who were interned, as we've heard, in hastily adapted short-term transit camps across the British mainland and in more permanent locations on the Isle of Man and in far-flung Commonwealth locations in Australia and Canada. Dachinger duly spent five months incarcerated at Highton Camp outside Liverpool in the recently built Wolf Hall Heath Corporation housing estate, divided from the outside world by an eight meter high barbed wire fence. Up to 5,000 internees were held at any one time, the majority Jewish victims of Nazi persecution, though a small percentage claimed allegiance to the Reich. Houses intended for a single family were crammed with up to a dozen occupants. And you can see on the right, a sketch from Hollitscher's diary in which he shows the rooms with four to five internees. Alfred Lomnitz, sorry. Other notable artists at Heighton included Samson Shamez, Martin Bloch, Walter Nessler, Alfred Lomnitz and Meidner. Many internees such as Hollitscher were released directly from Heighton while others such as Dachinger and Meidner were transferred onto the Isle of Man or sent abroad. As for the majority of heightened portraits, and indeed with portraits made during internment in, in general, 
The identity of Dachinger's sitter had become lost over time. However, through a remarkable set of coincidences, this was suddenly and unexpectedly revealed. On the 15th of March, 2018, then Ari's chairman David Glasser was interviewed on the BBC News for a soundbite about Brexit and museums in Britain. He happened to be filmed in front of the newly acquired portrait, which featured in the exhibition Out of Austria, and you can see the exhibition installation on the screen. And the exhibition marked the 80th anniversary of the Anschluss and Kristallnacht, events which had impelled so many Jewish refugees to flee Germany and Austria and led to the establishment of the British Kinder Transport Initiative, which enabled 10,000 Jewish children and adolescents to come to Britain. The program was viewed on television by Innes Newman, one of the sitter's granddaughters, who wasted no time in contacting Benary. Although, as we have heard, Innes was born after his death, she was able to confirm that the portrait painted in the third month of Dachinger's internment, depicts her Austrian Jewish refugee grandfather, Wilhelm Hollitscher. Hollitscher's detailed diary entries over a 10 week period in height and from the end of June to the end of August, 1940, record the portrait sittings and the period immediately after his release, providing a clear account, not only of the conditions of captivity and artistic endeavor behind the wire, but also of the relationship between sitter and artist and something of the wider emigre cultural scene in 1940s London. And here's Hollitscher's description of his first meeting Dachinger in camp on the 16th of July. And this is in translation, I quote. In the Skipton Road, there lives a young painter Dachinger, by name and appearance, a pure Aryan type, who's painted the walls of his room, occupied by five people, with very good naked women, end quote. Both men were amongst the circle of middle-class intellectuals, writers and artists in Haydn, whose collective presence contributed to the establishment of a wide range of cultural activities. Similar efforts evolved across all camps, including the so-called university at Hutchinson. Although Hollitscher was considerably older than Dachinger, a warm friendship developed, which continued post-internment. Dachinger made many portraits in camp, ranging from empathetic, instantly recognizable likenesses of his fellow internees, which contrasted to his sharply satirical and sometimes cartoonist works featuring camp officers, uh, to the more modernist semi-abstract interpretations, rather like the image on the right, uh, which have the graphic qualities of a poster. And the image on the right is a collaboration with Fritz Rosen, who also wanted to draw Hollitscher, and it celebrates internee Kurt Jus, founder of the German Ballet Jus and the Jus Leader School of Dance. With its surreal mismatched eyes, splashes of brilliant color and paint layered over collage sheets of newsprint, as Jessica Feather suggested in her catalog, accompanying her exhibition of work by interned artists at the Walker Gallery in Liverpool in 2004, internment gave the artist, quote, a degree of freedom to practice what had been banned in Germany, end quote. Dachinger also produced landscapes, the aforementioned nudes, including those enlivening the camp's very own Café Vienna, posters for camp events, multi-figured scenes depicting daily life, such as potato peelers here on the left, and brooding campscapes, on, like on the right, in a somber palette where the composition is often divided by the ever-present linear motifs of perimeter fence, barbed wire, and watchtowers. Beyond a basic desire to accurately represent camp topography, daily privations, petty humiliations, and the sheer boredom of internment, Dachinger also hinted at more complex psychological issues faced by internees, wrestling with their loss of identity, detained by the very country in which they had sought refuge. Some had already been in German concentration camps and were haunted by memories. Many were also uneasy at their ambiguous status, wondering whether in the event of invasion, they would be handed over to the Germans from whom they had already fled. In his striking view of the camp, overlain with a single surreal head entitled A Mad, Mad World, Dachinger succinctly sums up the whole wretched and destabilizing experience of internment. 
Although some artists were too depressed to work, others responded enthusiastically, professional and amateur alike. As traditional art materials were in short supply, they became increasingly resourceful. Newspapers repurposed as painting surfaces could be primed with gelatine from boiled down bones mixed with flour, uh, often leaving stories of war tantalizingly visible. Twigs were burnt to create charcoal, hairs were used for brushes, and paint was made from brick dust, toothpaste or vegetable juice, ground with linseed oil or olive oil from sardine cans. So over a fortnight in August 1940, Hollitcher recorded sitting for four portraits, the first on the 5th of August, and I quote his diary entry. Dachinger is making a pastel picture of me. This afternoon was my first sitting. He says that I don't laugh and he finds my head interesting, end quote. On completion on the 8th, Hollitcher described it as, quote, colorful, quite modern style. Interesting for me, he sees me such as I am. I look like a Prussian general. Strange resemblance to a photo that Hansel took of me after my first operation. More severe, more somber, more soft suffering. My look, sharp features with high cheekbones. Dachinger wants to make a second sketch and his friend likewise, end quote. The newspaper in the Benary portrait is dated the 6th of August, so perhaps it is the second version. It has a military feel, unconsciously reinforced by the vis visible headline top flight, top right, air fights in many spheres. And its large lapel suggests that it's not the, quote, overall suit, quote, end quote, which Hollitcher received in a parcel in late July and which he mentions in a diary entry. On the 14th of August, Hollitcher described Dachinger's third portrait, quote, I think the best yet. He says he's beginning to know me. Now he has discovered my intellectual head and I, simple fool, have discovered it too, end quote. He notes Dachinger's final version on the 21st, depicting, quote, the whole figure. The head, in my opinion, is the most successful. He gave me a sample of a beautifully created invitation by him and Rosen to the art exhibition and invited me to a sausage feast, end quote. Hollitcher then notes Dahinger's gift of a portrait sketch on the 26th of August, which is, quote, generally approved as good, a nice memento, end quote. And it's worth noting that portraits taken away from internment often serve as important documents of captivity, providing vital clues to the identity of both artist and sitter particularly for the Manx men's camps where records are surprisingly patchy. On the 30th of August, just prior to his release, Hollitcher visited the camp exhibition Art Behind Wire. This was one of the very first internment camp art exhibitions on the Isle of Man. Both Hutchinson and Onken, each with their own impresario and distinguished roster of artists, along with Maura Camp, at Ramsey to where Dachinger was later transferred, held well-publicized exhibitions in autumn 1940. Advertised with Dachinger's striking poster, foregrounding a single barb of wire and a stylized eye, Hollitch had described the exhibition thus, quote, in a new corrugated iron shed. The presentation was excellent with paper screens, sections. Obviously in camp, these were primitive measures. Dachinger has his own small room, my picture and Kramer's, everything on newspaper, much in pencil, charcoal, pastels and watercolour, some very good portraits, very witty caricatures. A lot of people say that Dachinger is the best and most talented, end quote. Hollitcher was then released and Dachinger transferred in October to Moura on the Isle of Man, also on the Isle of Man, from where he continued to produce artworks. And in November he held he held another exhibition, also entitled, entitled Art Behind Barbed Wire. Dahinger was finally released in January 41. He promptly held his first exhibition in a real London gallery at the Redfern in Cork Street, where it is still located today and where it continues to represent a number of distinguished emigres. The exhibition, which ran through April, was supported by the Free Austrian Movement in Great Britain, a left-leaning umbrella refugee organization with 7,000 members and a roster of high-profile emigre patrons, 
including Elias Canetti and Oscar Kokoschka. Advertised by the familiar, now familiar Art Behind Wire poster, the catalogue also incorporated the stylized barb motif in its top left corner. Of 40 exhibits, more than a quarter were portraits of some sort based on their titles, which included Philosopher, Once a Critic in Vienna, and The Man Who Never Saw Germany. The titles also suggest that the artworks were not only from Haydn, but from earlier internment in transit camps at Campton Racecourse and from later on at Mora. Honich's diaries after his release highlight the continuing relationship with Dachinger. Friendships forged in captivity were often deep and lasting, enabling emigres to create significant informal support networks post internment. For interned artists, contacts with their emigre peers and with emigre gallerists, such as the flamboyant former internee Jack Bilbo, were particularly meaningful. While the Red Fern exhibition, along with other wartime and post war shows at more established venues, including at Benuri, helped exiled artists to bring new German art to Britain, whether unfashionable expressionism or hard edged Bauhaus modernism. On the 14th of March, 41, Hollitcher recorded Dachinger's release, although the artist's 62-year-old father rather inexplicably remained interned, interned, along with an invitation to Dachinger's exhibition at the Red Fern, which Hollitcher, quote, will attend if at all possible, end quote. Hollitcher's diary for 18th of April notes that his intended visit was thwarted by air raids, quote, very heavy bombing in the night, had to cancel dentist, trains were not running. Wanted to use my stay in London to go to the Redfern Gallery to see the exhibition, seven months in an English internment camp, impressions painted by Hugo Dachinger, end quote. Hollitcher was more successful a week later, noting that artist and sitter dined at a quote, small eatery in Soho in continental style, end quote. Hollitcher also noted that Dachinger, quote, told me that an article about his exhibition has appeared in the picture post together with my portrait, end quote. And you can see the portrait in the middle on the right. Picture post was a pioneering weekly illustrated news magazine renowned for its groundbreaking photojournalism, a particular way of humanizing the war and an emigre pedigree. Co-founded in 1938 by Hungarian Stefan Laurent with British publisher Sir Edward Halton, it employed a number of emigre photojournalists, including Ken Hutton and Francis Reis. On the 12th of November, Hollitcher reported seeing his portrait in the latest issue, along with the caption, portrait of an anonymous internee, in the so-called picture medley section, described as, quote, picture stories in miniature, single pictures out of series, which in peacetime would have had one, two, or three pages to themselves, end quote. And here you can see the double page spread and the Dachinger works uh, surround the central spine towards the bottom. And if you look at the middle caption, um, it noted that Dachinger, quote, used a brush made from his own hair and newspaper for canvas, says he gets best results on the front page of the Times, but if hard put, it could muddle through with a Daily Telegraph or Manchester Guardian. Big headline papers, e.g. Daily Express, unsuitable. Large lettering shouts through paint, end quote. Hollitcher and Dachinger continued to meet sporadically and Hollitcher retained an interest in Austrian culture in exile. On the 8th of November, 41, he described visiting London again to quote, see an exhibition of Austrian painters. There were four pictures of Dachinger exhibited, end quote. This may have been the first annual exhibition of Austrian artists held in the premises of the Austrian Women's Voluntary Workers in London. The following autumn, Hollitcher recorded another trip where he quote, visited the Dachinger exhibition in the Modern Art Gallery, founded by former Onken internee Jack Bilbo in Baker Street, with the sole aim and purpose of helping art to survive and of giving the artist and the public a possibility of doing their part in the intellectual fight against dictatorial reactionism. 
Dachinger's paintings fear between pre-Raphaelite and Cubist, and he sold four of them, end quote. Honecher's last diary reference to Dachinger was on the 24th of April, 1943, when he witnessed Dachinger's marriage to fellow emigre artist Meta Gutmann. He noted that both artists expressed a wish to paint him in a style which he described as falling somewhere between Impressionist and Pre-Raphaelite. But because Hollitcher was unwell, he had a history of poor health, there would only be two sittings. Sadly, it seems likely that these never took place. A month earlier, on the fourth anniversary of his arrival in England, in March 43, Hollitcher wrote movingly that he was grateful for four years of a blessed old age and for the fact that his children and grandchildren are safe and healthy. And he mentions heart troubles, difficulties in sleeping and cramps. The diaries eventually closed rather abruptly on 6th of October, 1943. And of course, we're almost exactly on the anniversary of that last entry. And so with that, I will also close with a final comment that it's most appropriate that both Hollitcher's diary extracts and his marvelous portrait by Dachinger, now suitably identified, should be brought together to form the focus of this talk, acknowledging the often forgotten period of internment of aliens in Britain. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Rachel. I was fully expected. That was absolutely excellent. Um, and now, Ines, I believe you're going to give us the pleasure of hearing some extracts from the diary please go go ahead uh, you are muted that's it lovely i'm muted yeah, very good i'll, I'll start uh, with just reading an question so uh, uh, in the beginning of the diary Milham provides as i said a very graphic account of the horrific conditions of vienna after Angeles. but the bit i'm going to be reading is um the bit on internment so starting on the 27th of june sensation since yesterday morning, I've been interned. At 8.30, I was in the bath and a detective appeared, giving me an hour at Kempton Park. A race course, great confusion, about 1,800 people. I'm group number 28 slash two, number 148. So I have finally, at the age of 67, become a mere number. All valuables, documents and lives were taken off us. Books and writing materials after inspection by an officer were returned, thank goodness. This is only a transit camp. We are to move on in about two days' time. Given a mattress and two blankets, we slept close to one another on the ground. Morning ablutions were quite difficult, a crush. Not much fun, could be worse. That's it. Yesterday morning at 10.30, 645 of us were transported by a special train from Kempton to here, an alien internment camp in Liverpool. The last noteworthy happening at Kempton the day before yesterday, newcomers arrived all day. On Friday evening and Saturday morning, there were services in a specially designated, designated hall. I became aware as I was having my evening tea in the open air, of the Laker Doid, Dodi being sung. They are for the most part Eastern Jews, but also many Germans. I did not participate, but observed them from outside. Fanatic faith, grim determination not to be eradicated, even by a hungry Hitlers. The journey here arrived at 5.30 p.m. in the afternoon in the first class carriage under military guard. Lunchtime, we had bread and a small piece of cheese, no water. At departure and arrival, the older people were separated and transported by car to the camp, which was half an hour on foot from the station. But I, who was one of the oldest, was not taken by car. Apparently, I looked too young. Same fate in the camp here. Different atmosphere here, warmer and more peaceful reception. Only the top brass are militaristic. Most of the rest are in turn Jews. Very helpful and friendly, but a lousy setup. My group is in a large tent, about 25 by 10 meters. We were handed one rubber sheet on the, for the floor, straw and a straw sacks, a pillowcase and four woolen covers. 
We had to fill the pillows and the sacks ourselves. Distribution lasted until 11 at night. Didn't really work. The job was a bit much for me. I had a heart palpitation, lay down for half an hour. The next extract, 2nd of July, 1940. The commanding officers have made their lives easy. They leave it to the prisoners to sort out to their satisfaction. Self-government, it works quite well, except for people who go off and do their own thing. Everything summons up Jewish enterprise and a lot of noisy chatter. They are funny, my Jews. Without some business, they can't stand it. Everywhere, there are the beginnings of business ventures, mostly medical stations, a hospital, post office, a camp bank, and a lot of good healthy humor. Caricaturist Harrod Lester, cartoonist of a Viennese newspaper, has a weather idea, which has been published by the Advertising Bureau. In the main street, Pargolf Road, on every corner, there are shoe polishers. The best one is a Viennese who attracts clients with his good jokes. One shoe, a halfpenny, a pair, one penny. There are several hairdressers. The sign for the laundry called Star View is a starry sky with a comet tail. Text reading, it is already night, but Star View is still washing. The canteen is always crowded and so you're pleased to get something. There is an exchange, optimal rates, where you can advertise new razor blades sought in exchange for five cigarettes, a pair of socks for two ties, 10 words for one P. There is a Camp Porridge University, a gym keep fit program by practical training, a tailor, a shoemaker, and particularly popular is Chance, who offer to do the washing up, do your clothes or shoes or carry water. The hotel, is in one of the workers' houses. Gourmet food is advertised, also alcoholic beer, schnapps and wine. It is, of course, all a joke. There is a billing of a show, The Virgin Girls. Turning over, turnover, with the exception of the restaurant, is in pennies. We still cannot write letters. This will last a few more days. We will be allowed 28 lives. Lives. And it's so he's, that's dashing his view of the camp. And as you can see, it uh, shows what they think of the, uh, the, the poor prisoners in a very prostrate position. Right. The camp yesterday, this is 10th of July, was like a swarm of bees before their flight. The list of those 12,000 prisoners designated to travel overseas had to be completed. And as there were not enough volunteers, the missing number was selected ex officio. Among them were 55 year olds, married people who'd lived here for years and built up a life for themselves. In the faces of the departing travelers, one could read all human emotions. Among the young, mostly there was thoughtless unconcern. Among the older ones, resignation and despair. In addition, it was raining. Leave taken from Maya and Dr. Philippe was hard. To see the big man crying, I must keep smiling. 11th of July. Yesterday, I forgot to mention that an older man in one of the barracks attempted suicide through poisoning. I saw him being taken out unconscious. Cold, rainy weather, you sink in the mud. The worst scandal is that there is no WC paper. The feeling that I'm running about so dirty and filthy is not pleasant. Hope I don't become ill. This morning I remained lying down and had an unpleasant heart palpitation and breathing difficulties. Keep smiling. Once a new commandant came to the, uh, he was called Colonel Slater, Lieutenant Colonel Slater, and he was appointed commandant uh, on the 15th of July. Conditions in the camp got a lot better. The previous one had been unwilling or unable to mitigate the uh, conditions in the camp. And the entries after the 15th of July get, are much more cheerful from, from um, my grandfather. So the 22nd of July, yesterday evening, there was a football match played near the barracks. Almost all the players were Viennese. Among the spectators were English officers and soldiers who'd accessed the camp 
or were part of the team. Joyous. An English sentry with a gun who was standing on guard at the barracks behind the pitch twice kicked back the ball which had landed behind the goalposts. The goalie to the goalie. Only in England could this happen. 23rd of July. Yesterday evening there was a concert in Hat One. Two brothers, one a pianist and the other a violinist. They played Bach, Beethoven, Spring Sonatas, Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto. Good. Carl did some washing. My pyjamas too. I had not thought how he does washing. He does it by swishing his underpants through the cold water. Then he holds them up against the light. And if they're transparent, he is highly satisfied, chuckles happy to himself and hangs them up without ringing. 1st of August. There was a march to the parade guard for exercise under heavy military guard. Only 300 were omitted and about 1,500 had to stay behind. I no longer take part, not necessary. During the last war, war, a certain R posted a letter openly in a public post box and was locked up for 18 days. He'd wanted by doing this to demonstrate against oppressive postal conditions. This is one of the greatest scandals. Daily, a maximum of 200 letters get distributed, whereas 6,000 letters are posted weekly, which is surely, which are surely answered. I'll skip a bit because I can see that we are running to, to the end. So I'll just read you the epilogue um, of the last bit. So this is um, him back in Petswood with uh, Todd, who's the dog of the landlord, of whom he was very fond, and his final summary. Anyway, I have benefited from these last two months, which for me have been a valuable lesson in goodness and decency, as well as stimulating adventure, which I consider an enrichment in my twilight years. Apart from satisfying my sense of adventure, which at my age is something, I've got to know some fantastic people. Thanks to my innate positive attitude, I was able to give encouragement to those who were feeling depressed. But what will remain with me for the rest of my life is the knowledge of friendship and love, the attachment and warmth of all the Petswoodians. It is, and so it is in life. It is only when one falls into distress and needs help that real friendship reveals itself. They were all touchingly kind to me. So I came back with a feeling that I was back home again. I'm among good, empathetic friends to whom, as long as I live, I should continue to be grateful. So I'll leave it there and then we can open up to questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you ever so much, Ines. Uh, I don't see any questions yet, but please do start typing them in. I can't believe that there aren't things you would like to ask or indeed comment on. Uh, perhaps I can, let me first of all, hold on, let me just highlight the two of you. Um, spotlight everyone and just give me a minute um spot up there you are and maybe i'll also no, I'll, I'll remain small <laughs> on the screen um all sorts of things occur to me that i think could you know provide food for thought and for further discussion um the first thing perhaps is is a question that uh, i might address to rachel um which you comment on as i recall you know, quite um, often in your excellent essay for the Insiders Outsiders volume. And it ties in with the fact that Dachinger in this portrait under scrutiny here, it's done on the Times newspaper. And I'm immediately put in mind of a wonderful quotation from the art historian Klaus Hinrichsen, who incidentally was the subject of a talk by his own daughter just last week, which we have a recording of, but where he talks about the ingenuity yeah, the inventiveness with which people had to engage with unorthodox materials in order to create images. And I wondered, Rachel, whether you'd like to say something more about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it does seem to be an extraordinary capacity uh, that the, the internees had. I mean, on one hand, there seems to be a certain amount of traditional art materials that some of them took with them, you know, that, that despite this last minute, you know, early dawn arrest, many of the artists did take sketching materials with them, watercolor, the, the kind of things that were very portable. But obviously, once you're you're there in camp, this is a very finite resource. And then you're looking around for alternatives. And I love the ingenuity. Um, one of the artists, Samson Shammers, 
who had a, a wonderful beard, rather like Jack Bilbo. Um, you know, he was known for plucking his sort of stubby beard hairs, uh, you know, to make a brush. And then you can imagine that perhaps you would use um, your the hair on your head to make, um, you know, other fine finer brushes. And then there's um, the use of food, and that, of course also became slightly controversial. And I think maybe also Shammers as well was um, asked why he was using food stuff um, for art materials when it could have been used for eating. And his response was something along the line that he wanted to do something kind of good and lasting and, and, and creative. Um, so there seems to be this incredible impulse amongst certain artists just to be really resourceful and to look at what was there and to see how it could be repurposed. Um, we have amongst the few women artists who are recorded, um, one of them, Erna Nonnemacher, who was a sculptor, um, actually using clay from the soil and, and making a, a decorative tile. So there really seems to be sort of no end to, to the ingenuity. And it's also a story that I, th I think we find across all camps that it wasn't just here on the Isle of Man, but the that drive to create um, comes across um, in all the camps, you know, whether you're in the UK further afield or even, um, you know, elsewhere in the Second World War in Japanese camps. So it, it's absolutely a kind of universal impulse. Absolutely. I guess the most notorious example in the British context is, of course, Fitters, who, of course, is the, probably one of the best known of the internee artists, but using porridge, mouldy porridge for his sculptures. Yeah. But also on a yeah. more sombre note, you're absolutely right, and it's not. You mentioned the Japanese uh, camps, um, well, both in the Far East, but also the Japanese-American internment camps in, in, in uh, the USA, but also in the Holocaust, you know, in the Nazi camps as well, even in Auschwitz. I mean, creativity was truly against all the odds. And that's where that sort of need to improvise wildly is most acute. Um, there's an example, for example, uh, for, of um, uh, Zoran Muzic in Dachau, who apparently used the rust from his jail cells to create images. And it does really raise that very fundamental question, Rachel, that you've touched on, on that kind of urge to create in adversity, which seems to be a very, very you know, elemental sort of impulse. Anyway, that's a big, a big question to, to ponder further. We have got some questions coming in, as I, as I thought we would. Uh, yes, a question that I myself was going to ask from um, dance historian Laura uh, Gilbert. Um, may I know, uh, please, what do you, or yes, how, how much you know about the work of Dachinger with Kurt Use? What do we know of that relationship? Well, I think simply that, that Use was interned at, at the same time and was a prominent figure um, in camp and so there were a number of images to promote um, his activities. I think it's possibly documented further in the catalogue. I mentioned uh, the Jessica Feather art behind um, barbed wire catalogue from 2004 from the Walker in Liverpool. Um, and I could turn around and, and reach for it, but now's perhaps not the time. So, uh, Laure, um, yeah, if, if you um, follow up with the Walker, um, there may well be more information on that um, relationship. It's an intriguing connection. I can't resist uh, mentioning that Laura is actually going to be taking part in an event paying tribute to Kurt Just. Uh, this is the centenary of his birth. We're catching it just in time on the, I think Laura, we've decided it's the 16th of December. It hasn't yet been advertised publicly, but you could put it in your diary if you're so in, uh, inclined. He's a fascinating and important figure in the dance world, but with many interesting connections in other media as well. Um, Right, we've got a question from Robert Rumley. It's a rather general one. I, I don't know, Robert, what kind of websites you have in mind. I mean, I can certainly give you some leads to follow. Were you thinking specifically about internment? I don't know whether you'd like to either type in your answer or perhaps just unmute yourself and, and ask the question yourself. And I think there's been quite uh, a lot of uh, research done on Heighten, and there is a Heighten project. Um, again, if you go online, um, I don't remember the exact title, but um, no, it's oh, a side, no. You know what? That's Morse Mills. That's Morse Mills. But again, very topical. Um, that was a rather brutal, more brutal internment camp. But there's a Morse Mills project. Uh, absolutely. And I was going to mention that apropos your mention of Kempton Park um, in this. That of course there were many. Uh, really very insalubrious, shall we say, uh, transit camps in which people were dumped admittedly for a short time mostly, um, prior to their uh, ending up either in Heighton and or the Isle of Man and Worth Mills, which uh, Rachel has mentioned is 
particularly notorious and it sounds absolutely appalling there's no excuse whatsoever for the unhygienic conditions that prevail there and there's a wonderful project called the Worth Mills Project uh, that's one for you Robert and the rest of you as well if you'd like to pursue it which you can easily find on online. Um, Robert. Robert Grimley here. I've I've mastered a bit of the technology now, so I can speak to you in answer you. to your question of some minutes ago. I was really thinking of websites that had good visuals. I very much appreciated the uh, pictures uh, that we have seen uh, in the uh, last hour, uh, but um, something that would enable one to get a pick up the visual impact uh, of uh, the lives both of artists and sitters. I'm, I'm not sure there's really one specific website that, that does that. I mean, there have been so many separate lines of inquiry. Um, Schwitter's made wonderful portraits in internment. And I would guess that if you go to the Schwitter's um, foundation in Germany, to their website, because they have catalogue raisonné, and there will be, I'm sure, a section on his internment portraits. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, at the University of um, Hatton Gallery at Newcastle has something about uh, the Fred Ullman portrait that was done in internment. Uh, Fred Ullman uh, wrote about his time in internment and drew wonderful um, sort of imaginary uh, critiques while he was interned. Uh, so Ullman is another one to um, track down. Um, just trying to think. Anything else off the top of my head? No. You might also, if I can just, sorry, Ines, did you want to? So the Benjamin uh, uh, site itself, is, if you look at specific artists, you get... Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, and, and we did actually do um, a sort of online exhibition relating to um, interned artists. Um, though obviously the images are not all about internment, but they're made by artists who were interned. So yeah, that's a, that's a resource. And on, on Heighten, uh, the, the, there's some quite nice, you can either do it through YouTube or there is a Heighten, uh, a Kirk Lees, arc, uh, it's ARC, it's called, it's uh, archive in Kirk Lees, uh, which Heighten's part of. Um, there, there's, there's a little bit there, uh, but there's some nice podcasts about the local reactions to internment from local people. Uh, local people on the whole thought that these internees were Nazis. They didn't want to be views. And uh, then gradually got to realise that some of them are quite nice, really. <laughs> you get, you get uh, so it, it's quite, there's some quite interesting little, little um, YouTube uh, videos on that. Absolutely. You might also, if I can just chip in, there's also a really interesting resource called Hidden Treasures, organised by um, Dawn Waterman of the Jewish Board of Deputies, uh, which is about archives of Jewish interests throughout the country. But there is actually one specifically on the very rich archival holdings on the Isle of Man at the Manx National Heritage. So that's another resource. Also, we have uh, yes, there are many books. I tell you what, I'm aware of time rushing past and there's some other interesting questions coming in. What I will do if you're interested, all of you perhaps, you know, I will, I, there's, there are many places you, you can turn, including again, the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel, which has a whole subsection now on internment related talks, which of course include a lot of visual material, but it is, it's, it's a rich and I think increasingly still to be, you know, people realize how much there is still to find out. Um, there was a question indeed about the reaction. Yes, I mean, you know, to think, again, going back in this to what you were saying about the shamefulness. I mean, I'm, I'm very struck. I mean, just sort of stepping back, you know, your grandfather's diary, it's an odd and slightly disconcerting mixture of darkness and light, isn't it? Sort of flippancy and a sense of real trauma, in, in fact. Um, and we know from other people as well, Fred Ullman's a case in point, that actually as time went by, they became more and more, um, what shall I say, tolerant of the British government's actions in retrospect. Respect. But at the time, I think it really was the most, well, it's a mad, mad world. I mean, the title of that one work, in a sense, says it all utterly surreal, but actually in a very dark and, and troubling way in many, in many respects. Um, absolutely. Um, okay, I think we're going to probably have to wind up fairly soon, but I've got a question uh, here from Lily Richard. Sorry if I missed it, uh, but what was the history of the portrait from the time it was painted until the time that the Venery acquired it? And we that's don't know. A good, a good question. Mm. We absolutely, mm. we don't know. So it came up for auction, um, you know, unidentified. Um, yeah, and it was only that we were familiar with Dachinger and we knew what an internment portrait looked like, looked like that you know, we were able to recognize and, and bid for it, but no. So if anybody knows in the same mm -hmm. way that um, Innes and her family don't know how the diary um, 
got to the Vena Library. I mean, it's a story full of, of mystery. I did try to get from the auction house to tell us where it had been. Um, and there are some other portraits, as, as, as Rachel said, uh, shows this one in the uh, this is a, this is a different portrait and uh, there, there are a few different ones around and, and we don't know where the other ones are. Um, the auction house, uh, they refuse to tell you anything. They call it client confidentiality and I think they're being really unhelpful. But I knew the auction house had sold it uh, before I, uh, um, I identified it on the television and I wrote to them and said, uh, could they tell me who they sold it to? And they wouldn't tell me they sold it to Ben Urin. So they were extremely unhelpful. <laughs> and anybody in the audience and then that was a serendipitous <laughs> moment yeah mm -hmm. so many holes in an absolutely fascinating story um you've probably all seen but i'll say it anyway that anna nyberg has pointed out that another very interesting internee artist robert this one for you is helmut weissenborn and um work of his is in the imperial war museum so there are you know a whole range of different places you you can look it's just too intriguing mm -hmm. Ab absolutely and Carry just on, going to throw in one final. Mm -hmm. um, so Alfred Lomnitz was interned in Haydn with Dachinger and Hollitscher, and his account, a very sort of sanitized account, was published by Macmillan in 1941, so immediately after his release, to convey to the public that it was this rather lovely holiday experience. And the title, Never mind Mr. Lom. This was apparently what his char lady said to him as Lom was uh, arrested early in the morning and taken away by the police. She gave him a cheery wave and said, never mind Mr. Lom. So that was, you know, how, how the locals um, were treating the, the prospect. Um, so yes, to add that to the mix. Absolutely. And there was a talk just a week or two back by Sonia Lambert, who's written an, a novel inspired by the whole internment episode. And she in turn talked and was inspired by some pre-existing sort of contemporary accounts of internment. So you might like to check that out as well. Lots of thanks coming in. Uh, I think, well, you can see this is a rich terrain, isn't it? It's filled with much to be found out. So uh, continue <laughs> listening and, and, and exploring if you would. Perhaps I should just end, first of all, by thanking Rachel and Innes very much indeed, and for the rest of you for being here. But let me just uh, remind you one last time that there is a talk about music behind barbed wire, another fascinating and related topic coming up at eight o'clock if you've got the time and energy to sign up. If you go to the What's On section of the Insiders Outsiders uh, website, it's www.insidersoutsidersfestival.org, but you can probably find it easily courtesy of Google. Uh, that's at eight o'clock tonight. I've mentioned the previous recordings. Um, I will, as I say, follow this event up with a whole roster of links, uh, including one to the book itself. Uh, and last but not least, uh, well, yes, there's the trip itself, um, which should be fascinating in late March, 27th to the 30th of March. Sadly, had to be postponed, as I explained earlier, but hopefully will be happening in the early spring. And last but not least, I'd like to alert you to what I suppose could be seen as a kind of sequel to this series of internment related events, which I should have said earlier has been organized in uh, collaboration with Jewish Renaissance magazine my ally also on the trip itself. But we're putting in place, we have put in place, and all the details are available both on the Jewish Renaissance website and also again in the What's On section of the Insiders Outsiders website, um, a series of talks which explores running from the 28th of October right through to mid-December, which we've called, I think quite sort of catchily, we've called Spies, Lies and Secret Missions, the unsung Jewish heroes of World War II. And it seems to me it's a natural sequel because here you've got this ridiculous situation, these talented, fascinating individuals, you know, Nazis, the victims of the Nazis, those who found they, you know, they were here and then not safe after all, put behind by Boyer when all they really wanted was to contribute to the war effort. And what this next series is going to focus on is the diverse and often really quite surprising and actually extraordinary and very courageous sometimes ways in which some of those former internees and refugees from Nazism did indeed contribute to the British war effort. So do look out for that as well. Okay, thank you again, Rachel and Ines, all the best everyone. And perhaps see thank you- Thank you, Monica. Thank you everyone for attending. Good night. Good night. Thank you, good night.